Good evening. Words are futile to express how much we appreciate your support of the Stefan Adelikor for Life Foundation. In our time of weakness, you have given us strength. And at our darkest hour, you have given us light. Your generosity demonstrates that for every situation, there is a purpose. And with every ending, there is a new beginning. A life lost, yet a legacy is found. And the mission of embracing the less fortunate is underwritten. Our heavy hearts have been suited in witnessing the immense impact the Foundation has had in salvaging life and curing ills. We are all descendants of God, and it's imperative that we protect, nurture, and provide healing to his creation who are a part of him. As said so eloquently by our distinguished speaker tonight, Mr. Eli Wiesel, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it's indifference. The opposite of faith is not her say, it's indifference. And the opposite of life, it's not death, it's indifference. Without you and your belief in our cause, there would be no purpose for us, and Stefan's passing would have been of no consequence. You have all made a difference in our lives, of those in, in the lives of those who reach out to you in the name of our beloved son, Stefan. May your lot in life multiply for the good that you all present and provide. The highest degree of charity is where the one who gives and the one who receives are not aware of each other. You have all demonstrated the true heart of charity. We have gathered here this evening to endorse the Stefan Adelikor for Life Foundation, and in so doing, we honor those whose vision of life seeks to make our world a better place. In a world that periodically rears its ugly head, we are comforted in the knowledge that there are those special people whose very existence instill a sense of hope and belief for a better tomorrow. Knowing that to be good is a common achievement, but their purpose is to supersede the ordinary and strive for greater accomplishments through their selfless deeds and relentless efforts. The ideology that depicts their lives is described in a quote by Adam Smith as being, to feel much for others, and little for themselves. To restrain their selfishness and exercise their generosity with affection, which constitutes the perfection of their human nature. It is these highly regarded principles that defines the very character and personality of the person which we have the distinct honor of introducing to you this evening. But knowing that well done is better that well said, and my dear friends, Mr. Eli Wiesel has truly done well. Where his actions of tolerance, perseverance, humility, and strength of character speaks much louder than these words. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you the incomparable Mr. Eli Wiesel. Dear Sohila, you invited me to speak about repairing the world, or we call it in Hebrew, Tikkun Olam. And you wanted actually this lecture to be linked to the memory of your son. He was a student at my university. I heard a lot about him, but I wasn't there when it happened. I heard about his taste for friendship, his passion for life. 
And one thinks, what does one do then when one remembers? In our tradition, memory is linked to learning, which means when we want to remember someone who is no longer here, we study usually a perek, a chapter of Mishnah. And we hope not only that this, but we believe, helps the soul to ascend to higher spheres. But more than that, on a different level, learning for the soul means that since the soul believed in learning, we link our learning to its. And this is what we shall do tonight. Now, in our tradition, you know, one of the most celebrated commandments in the Bible is uh, which means we shall choose life. It's a commandment. One must choose life. And this commandment has many implications, even in the field of halakha, of the law. And I'm convinced that when you hear anyone speak about tragedy and hope, that speaker always refers to that. You shall choose life. But being a student of Talmud, I like to always, if I can, try to find a different interpretation and not to repeat what we already know. And therefore, I would like to say, for those who know Hebrew, it should also mean choose the living. Chayim means both life and the living. Choose the living. Meaning it's true that we owe a loyalty to those who are no longer here but it should never be at the expense of the living. The living who need us every minute of our life and theirs. The living who need our commitment, our sympathy, our empathy, our friendship, our help. And this especially applies to my generation. My generation you a way of dying that none before us has ever approached. Usually we try to teach us how to live in a thousand ways. My generation learned how to die in a thousand ways. We lived with the dead and we lived in death. And the danger was that the death would take hold of us and keep us prisoner. It would have been normal. We have seen too much. And here comes the law. Wait a second. Yes, memory, absolutely. But it should not be at the expense of the living. Therefore, Ubaharta Bahayim, choose the living, which means any child has rights over me be that child Jewish or not, a child has a right over me because the child has the future. And that child's future may involve the highest hope or the darkest despair, depending on those who teach that child what path to follow. So you, so you, know, you want to speak about repairing the world? Oh yes, the world needs repair. The world needs repair on every single level. Wherever you touch it, it hurts. In my little town, they used to say, and here the rabbi will speak after me, Rabbi Tokea. He comes from a place not far from my own. We used to say, when a person is sick, wherever you touch that person, and it hurts, and the world is sick. Lately, all we hear about is economy. Of course, economically, we are sick. We know that. And we don't know what to do. I am not an economist. 
I've never studied economy, I don't know anything about financing. But I know the consequences. And to me it's always learning. And I wonder, how is it possible that this catastrophe has not been foreseen? And I meet colleagues, Nobel laureates in economy, and I meet people, I go to conferences, I just came back from the World Economic Forum in, in Dubai, usually I go to Davos. I know nothing about economy, but they opened it to culture, so I go there for culture, but I hear about economy. Not one of them had ever foreseen the catastrophe. I hear then what I found out, that some people on the lower level did issue warnings, but they were not received, they were too low. But on the highest level, nothing. What does it teach us? It simply teaches us something that, my, again, my generation has learned. That the unthinkable can happen. The impossible is possible. On every level, again. Everywhere. In psychology or philosophy or in life. It happens. It can happen. So the lesson is that it can happen. You come, most of you come from Iran. And there you, you know better than I the situation in Iran. If the world needs repair, it needs repair in Iran as well. And the first thing in Iran, in order to repair itself, it must get rid of Ahmadinejad who brings shame on his nation, on his culture, on his statesmanhood. He brings shame for a man like him to come to the United Nations and simply say openly that he wants atomic bombs to destroy the Jewish people, to be the number one Holocaust denier in the world. Oh yes, it needs repair. The fact that the United Nations listened they had to invite him because the protocol demanded it. But the fact that the diplomats in the General Assembly did not get up and leave the hall, oh yes, even the UN is repaired. Only two delegations left, the Israeli and the American. And the others were there applauding, my God, what does it mean? The world needs repair. Had it been different, there would be no racism today. And racism exists even in small cities. I just met two officers here who work against racists. And they tell me, yes, we have a problem. We have a problem. Cemeteries can be profanated or words used to humiliate others. Now why should the enemies of our people choose to profanate tombs? First, they were against living Jews. But why dead Jews? Why do they go to cemeteries? There isn't a week without somewhere a cemetery be profanated. The world needs repair because the oldest, the oldest moral disease in recorded history, which is anti-Semitism, is still here. Why should it be? I addressed the United Nations General Assembly a few years ago, the first time they helped with that issue. And I, I, I said to them, look, if Auschwitz hasn't cured the world of anti-Semitism, what will and what can? We thought that it died in Auschwitz. The people learned never again to engage in hatred of the Jewish people, because we know one thing. Anti-Semitism was not the only element in Auschwitz. But without it, there would have been no Holocaust. 
So I thought it was finished. One thing at least we know. I was wrong. So the world needs repair. The world needs repair because something went wrong. And I don't even know when I know, historically when, in the 20th century. But exactly what day, I don't know. But something went wrong, and when something went wrong, it affected every endeavor of any human being. Words lost their meaning. Principles do not apply to human conduct as they used to. We go and we look for leadership and there is no moral leadership in the world. You ask yourselves, where are the great men or women of today? who when they speak, people stop and listen. And the answer is, of course, the leaders of today actually were killed when they were one or two or three. It takes more than one generation for leadership to grow, to, to assert itself. So where does one begin? As a teacher, I try to teach Humanities, meaning I like to teach the humanity of the human being. And some of my students occasionally ask, where does one begin? There are so many areas where so many people suffer. Do you know, I'm sure you know, you must, you are intelligent that every minute somewhere in the world a child dies of disease or of hunger or of thirst or of hatred or of violence every minute so while we are spending here an hour 60 children will die what do we do about it and you want to tell me that we cannot save them of course we could Hundreds of and millions of people suffer from hunger. From hunger. Now what is hunger? I call it the shame of hunger. I call it because I, I knew what hunger was, what it is. And I prepared once a lecture on that. I went back to the sources. I like to go to the sources and I found the source in Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, he speaks about Kherpat Raaf, the shame of hunger. And I said to myself, he is wrong. Why should the hungry people, in addition to being hungry, also feel shame? And then I said, oh, no, no, no. I misunderstood him. When a person is hungry, I should feel shame not that person. So where is the shame? More, we can go on. Had the world learned of the consequences of what it had allowed to be done to our people, there would have been no Rwanda, no Darfur, no Cambodia, no Bosnia, no civil wars, no attempted genocides. It hasn't learned. So where do you begin? I mean, you one, we shouldn't exaggerate, of course, because this is only the negative. Good things also happen. In technology, in science, in medicine, great, great, great progress has been made. In 50 years, more progress has been made and more has been attained than in 5,000 years years. All of a sudden history went fast. The acceleration of time was felt everywhere. Furthermore, on, on the social and religious level, I must say that never, never 
in the history of Jewish-Christian relations have we witnessed such a closeness between these religions as we know now? Never. It's true it began with John Paul, Pope John Paul, John, 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 the, John the 23rd, followed by John Paul the II. It, it began the, the marvelous ecumenic movement when priests and rabbis meet regularly to work together against prejudice. That's great. We made one mistake. We forgot a third partner, Islam. It began in the 60s. There was no problem of Islam, but nevertheless, we should have foreseen that. So we should have in introduced Islam too. Rabbis, priests, and, and qadis, or imams. And why not organize study sessions? One week they should meet and study the Bible, the next the New Testament, the third one the Quran. When people study, nothing bad can come out. But the situation today is really that it is better than ever before. So things are happening. Then, of course, also, we have Israel. For us Jews, Israel is a center, an anchor. Now, how did we manage in three years? To me, it is still, and I studied psychology in Sorbonne, but I still don't understand it. How did we manage to go from 45, when the chimneys were still burning, and the survivors just came out with their scars. In three years, to go from the darkest point in our history to the most luminous one, the renaissance of the Jewish people on its ancestral homeland. Many people had been deported, exiled by the Babylonians and the Romans, by everybody. But we too, but the only people that returned to its homeland is the Jewish people. And at the same time, the only people of antiquity to have survived antiquity is the Jewish people. And therefore, I wonder how did we do that? Another question. Where is our anger? In 1945, normally, the Jews would, should have, at least in Europe, in those in former occupied Europe, responded with anger, almost with rage at everybody. Where was the anger? And I tried to build then a connection. Somehow we learned how to channel anger. And instead of allowing anger to dominate our behavior and our obsessions, which could have turned into hatred, which is never an option. We channeled it into something, into a prophetic, a prophetic experiment to rebuild the state of Israel. So Israel is there, threatened again. Again, terrorism and more terrorism, suicide terrorism, the plague of the 21st century, totally new, the cult of death. It, I, I am worried when I study it. It's because I go back to history. In the 11th century, there was the Sabah, the Sheikh al Sabah, who sent emissaries all over Islam with a dagger. They didn't know each other. And they only had one mission, to go to a certain place and wait for orders. And the orders were usually to kill and kill oneself. And this is what the suicide bombers are doing now, suicide killers. How can we stop them? The only advice I tried to find was actually to declare them criminals against humanity, suicide 
terrorism should be called a crime against humanity. It would not stop the killers, but it would stop their accomplices. Because suicide, terrorism, if it is crime against humanity, that means no statute of limitation, immediate, uh, immediate delivery, extradition of the culprit. It's not something that's, which is not, it's very serious. So the problem is that we, we, we organize, we try to organize now a conference of the best legal minds. What makes a killer into a terrorist? What makes a terrorist into a suicide terrorist? What makes a suicide terrorist into a crime against humanity? Once we have the definition, we already spoke to many head of states, we can push it to parliaments and bring it to the United Nations and go on. But it means even on that level, it has to be repaired. How do, again, how does one begin? There is a marvelous Hasidic story about the great Hasidic master who one day decided he must repair the whole world. How does one do that? We know how. Our tradition tells us the Messiah will come either when the whole world becomes guilty or the whole world becomes just. So he said, he, why not? He will try to work and bring the whole world to redemption, to penitence. Where does one begin? The world is self-world. Well, in one's own country. But the country has so many cities and villages to begin in one's own the hometown. The town has many streets to begin in one's own home. The home has many tenants to begin then in one's own apartment, in one's own room, with oneself. Which means to, to repair the world, I have to repair myself. Is it possible? How does one repair? And here I believe really, if not the answer, at least the, the direction is clear to me. I do not and cannot define my humanity unless it is by the humanity of the other. I define my humanity in relationship to yours. Alone, God alone is human. He says it when, when I say that God alone is alone. We are not. We are not meant to be. The moment there is someone else in need, I cannot say I want to be alone. This is good for the hermit, but not for someone who lives in society, who believes in the living. So we say, since I define myself towards you, with you, by you, I must listen to you, read you, feel what you feel. I, I, I teach philosophy and I love philosophy. And among the philosophers, there are certain that I, of course, I admire, and nevertheless, I have problems with them. But I have problems with, with all, all, all that exists. Take, for instance, Plato. You cannot teach philosophy without Plato. And Plato, but the problem, he was great, but the problem is, hey, hey, he hated poets. He hated women. He condoned slavery. More, he condoned the death sentence issued against his teacher, Socrates. What happened then? There was something missing. He forgot the other. And that's wrong. As for Socrates, when he was sentenced to death, wait, he had a choice. 
He had to choose between exile and death, and he chose death. Had he been Jewish, he would have chosen exile. Because each time when we had that choice, we chose exile. We learned how to live in exile. Prophet Jeremiah even sent a message to the Jews in Babylon while you are in exile. Marry, have children, build homes, build schools, synagogues, build, build in exile. In parenthesis, years ago, the Dalai Lama called me when he came to America for the first time. He wanted to meet me and I was very, very moved by that because I, as a student, at one point, I was taken by Hinduism. I studied the Hindu tradition and I, I went to India. I knew the Hindu text by heart, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Gitas. I, I learned everything by heart. I come from a yeshiva background. And I felt he wants to see me, my God. My dream was to go to Tibet one day. Yes, sir, what can I do for you? He said, look, he began saying he had some of my writings. And, and then he said, you know, your people left your homeland 2,000 years ago, but you are still here. Mine has just left its homeland, but I know it's going to be a long road, <coughs> a long road. Teach us the art of survival. So how do we do in exile? I told him, number one, what kept the Jewish people alive <coughs> is, first of all, generosity and solidarity. Whatever happened to one community affected all other communities. And when the Jews were exiled from Jerusalem, and they, were, they followed the Roman legions to France. Wherever they came, there was already a small Jewish community to receive them, to take care of them, to offer them their warmth and their hope and their fraternity. When Jews were exiled from Spain, they were accepted. Right away in Greece, in Italy, in Morocco, but the Sparti community, everywhere. There were everywhere there were Jews for that solidarity. And the second thing I said to him, look, when we left Jerusalem, we did not take our money with us, not even our jewels. We take with us a little book, the Torah. And that little book bequeathed hundreds and more books, and more and more and more. In other words, a passion for learning. What saved us was that passion for learning. So what do we learn now? We learn how to build on the ruins. We learn how to begin life again. The beginning is only God's Bereshit. All that we can do is begin again. And each time there is an encounter between a young boy and a beautiful girl at school or in the, somewhere at home. It's not only a beginning, it's a beginning again. There were so many times in our history that we felt, why do that? When the temple was destroyed, the Parushim, the Pharisees, decided not to get married. Not to live, and those who live who were married, men and women separated, not to have children. Because they said, we don't want to bring children into this world. And they even said, if God wants to destroy the world, we have no right to bring children to his world. But they were overruled. They were overruled because in that case it would have meant the end of the Jewish people. And the Jewish people ended more than once chapters, but not its history. So, Sohila, what 
does one do to repair the world? You begin here, and here, you, of course, you ask yourselves, should we begin helping people because they are Jews and ignore and forget all the others? It would have been an option, but I think the wrong option. What is so beautiful in the Israeli hospitals is in every hospital. I know in Tel Shomer, which I know best, or, or Shari Tzedek, I used to be linked to it very closely. They don't make any difference between Jews or Palestinians. Sometimes you have in the same room some Palestinian who tried to kill and was wounded and his victim almost one bed next to another. And the doctors take care of both. And you say, really, my God, how do they do that? But they do it. The Talmud has a question. If there are poor people in your town and in other towns, what is your obligation? Simply to take care of your own? And the Talmud says, no. Aniyeh simply the poor people of your town have priority. Priority, yes. Exclusivity, no. We must help others as well. But first come, naturally, our own Jews, but then the others. And therefore, the yeshiva student that I was, still am. The Jew that I am, feel that absolutely I am heart and soul connected to and loyal to, to our people and the Jewish state. And whatever is connected to the Jewish people or to Israel is my concern. I said it in my Nobel speech. However, we cannot be indifferent to others. You mentioned, Sohila, my words on indifference. I am fighting indifference. How can I accuse others of being indifferent or having been indifferent to our faith if I am indifferent to other people's suffering? I cannot. And therefore, I shall give you a conclusion. There comes a moment in one's life when one must make a kind of cheshbon and effort, a kind of soul searching, saying, what have I done? What do I really believe in? You call it anima mean, I believe, the credo. And this is really my credo, my belief about how to repair wounds that cannot be healed, how to bring hope to a world that rejects it, and how to begin again. And this is my anima mean. What I say is, as a Jew, I believe that I can and must express my being part of humanity only through my Jewishness. The more Jewish the Jew, the more universal his or her message. My Jewish experiences are rooted both in the memory of my people and also in the history of all people. What I say as a Jew, a Catholic or a Protestant or a Buddhist or an agnostic could say about their religious or non-religious affiliation or ethnic origin. One is neither superior nor inferior than any other. As a Jew, I consider that all that I acquire, I must share with all those who live as I do in God's world. 
I belong to a traumatized generation that often felt abandoned by God and betrayed by mankind. And yet I believe one must not estrange oneself from either God or mankind. Was it yesterday or eternities ago that some of us have realized that human beings are capable of unspeakable brutality? That for killers it was human to be inhuman? Are we then to give up on humanity or on God? We always must ask the questions. Is man God's victim or God's failure? Is man God's prisoner or his orphan? Are we destined forever to be adversaries rather than associates? I believe that every day it is incumbent upon us to choose anew between deadly warfare among adults and the right of children to grow up without fear, with a smile on their face, between ugly hatred and the nobility of opposing it, between inflicting pain and humiliation and inventing a beginning of solidarity and hope. Not to choose is also a choice, said Albert Camus, a wrong choice. I know I speak of experience, that even in the midst of darkness it is possible to create light and share warmth with one another, that even on the edge of the abyss it is possible to dream exalted dreams of compassion, that it is possible to be free and strengthen the ideals of freedom, even within prison walls, that even in exile, friendship becomes an anchor. One minute before one dies, there may be hope in his or her heart. One minute before I die, I am still immortal. In the final analysis, I believe in man in spite of man, I still believe in his or her future, in spite of what human beings have done to the principle of human dignity. Oh, I believe in God, but my faith in God is wounded. But I must not allow the wounds of my faith to inflict wounds on others. I still believe in language, although it has been distorted, corrupted and poisoned by the enemy. I still cling to words, for it is we who decide whether they become prayers or curses, spears or bomb, carriers of bigotry or vehicles of understanding, whether they, use, they are used to, to cause shame or to give comfort. All words words, life and death depend on words. In school or in the laboratory it is incumbent upon us to turn information into knowledge, knowledge into sensitivity and sensitivity into commitment. Ultimately it is we who decide whether words are to be turned into poisoned arrows or into peace offerings whether they will move us to heresy or to faith. Yes, I belong to a generation that has learned that whatever the question, despair is not the answer. Whatever the experience, indifference is not an option. We must believe that every day is an offering and every person is an ally. We must believe that we can achieve that to make every person in the street or far away not an enemy, not even his own enemy, but an ally and a friend. But then what we do is that all we can do, give meaning to our life and to give 
a sacred dimension of humanity to every moment we live. And we do it with words, with gestures, with miracles. For such is the wonder of art. A tale of indifference breaks down its icy armor and the tale of despair ultimately becomes a tale against despair. So this is what I believe. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, a few words from the greatest and wisest rabbi we've ever known, Rabbi Marvin Tokayer. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming this evening. I'm very touched by your presence. It is a singular and exceptional honor to follow immediately Nobel Laureate Professor Elie Wiesel, who just now celebrated his 80th birthday. And we wish him continued success, good health, and long life. And just a few days ago, received an honorary doctorate degree in Israel from the Technion University, and he rushed back to be with us here this evening, tonight. Permit me to share just a few words with you in a few minutes. When I lived in Tokyo, Japan, serving as the rabbi of the Jewish community of Japan, the Summer Olympics were held in Germany, and a great tragedy took place. The Israeli athletes were attacked and many of them were murdered. And it became a great moral scandal. The Olympics were over, the athletes returned home, and things returned to normalcy. In Tokyo, Japan, at our Jewish community center, at our synagogue, 30 days later, we held a memorial service for the fallen Israeli athletes. We announced it in the newspaper. I received a telephone call from the president of the Japan Olympic Foundation, who was also at the Olympics with his own athletes from his country. Obviously, he wasn't Jewish. Obviously, he didn't speak English. He read the announcement in the press. He asked if he could come. And of course, the doors are open. And he did come with the with many of the Japanese athletes who participated in the Olympics. He then asked me if he could speak to the congregation that was present. And I gave him the floor. He spoke in Japanese. And as he was speaking, it took maybe 30 seconds, and everyone realized that a great change was taking place. He was not speaking to the audience. He was not speaking to the congregation. He was speaking to the souls of the Israeli athletes who had fallen in the Olympics. He ignored everyone sitting in front of him, and he spoke directly to their souls as a good Buddhist would speak to their souls. I would like to speak for a moment to the soul, the neshama of Stefan Adelipur. I remember you very well. I said Kaddish for you. Time has passed, Stefan, but you are warmly remembered by your mother, by your father, by your brothers, by your grandparents, uncles, 
aunts, cousins, friends, community. Your friends from Great Neck and your friends from Boston made an effort on a cold evening to come here, not to listen to me, but to remember you. Your memory is indeed a blessing, and so much good is now done in your name to help others to make this world a better world. Your soul can be very proud of being remembered so long by so many who are here tonight and those who could not be here tonight in the audience of the auditorium at CW Post. If I could share one message with you which is so meaningful personally to me, I hope it will be to you as well. The ancestors of the Jewish people were shepherds. Abraham was a shepherd, Isaac was a shepherd, Jacob was a shepherd, Moses was a shepherd, David was a shepherd. Our ancestors were shepherds. No one today here is a shepherd, but we have a shepherd mentality. What does a shepherd do? He takes the sheep out to pasture. And while the sheep are grazing in the sun or in the rain, he sits under a tree and probably dozes off for most of the day. How many sheep did he take out this morning? 263. Mm. Or was it 264? Who could remember numbers exactly? It makes a difference. Because if you bring the sheep back and you're missing one sheep, don't go back and look for the sheep in the morning. The wolf will find it before you find it. As many sheep as you bring out, if you're a good shepherd, you bring them home. So how many sheep did I take out today? To avoid the error, every shepherd had a pouch, a pocketbook. And for each ship, each sheep that he took out, he put a pebble in the pouch. And he kept that pebbles in that pouch. And when he brought them home, for each pebble that he, for each sheep that he brings home, he would take out one pebble. And if when they're all home he sees two pebbles left in the pouch, he goes running back to find the two lost sheep. What happens if a sheep dies during the day? That sheep is not coming home. What does the shepherd do? He takes the pebble out of the pouch because the sheep is not coming home, not counted anymore. In the biblical story, King David was very old. And Abigail, or Abigail his wife, says to him, that no matter what will happen, no matter what time will bring to us, I can promise you that I will always keep your pebble in the pouch. That's why we're here tonight. Keep the pebble of Stephan Adelipur in the pouch. Remember him. There's a foundation in his name. In his name, not my name, not your name. There's a foundation in his name. What did it do? The foundation, because of you and me and all of us, has a trauma and a burn ward at a hospital in Jerusalem. It helps create a Schneider Children's Hospital in Israel, and more and more and more. Why did that happen? Because we kept the pebble in the pouch. When one visits the Jewish cemetery, what does one do at the gravestone that you visit? You put a pebble on top of the tombstone to show that you remember and you keep the pebble in the pouch. Frequently on the bottom of the tombstone, we write, Teheid nishmato tzirura b'tzror hachayim. May his soul be bound up in the bond of eternal life. I don't know what that means. But two words are identical in that one line, tzrura and tzror. And what is tzror? A pebble. Keep the pebble in the pouch. Please remember to remember Stefan. I don't have to remind you to remember Stefan because you're here because you remember Stefan. But give whatever you can 
and support with whatever means you can. The amount not important, the intention important of supporting the Stefan Adelopour Foundation for Life. Support the life of others in his name by doing that very good deed. Keep the pebble in the pouch. There will now be a 20 minute intermission to be followed by the entertainment for the evening. Thank you very much. Ten minutes and then the second part of the program will start. Thank you. Thank you.